Hi everybody and welcome back to Do More. Now, first of all, I think I must apologize for the drip feed of uploads on the channel. Uh, I was actually quite busy at the end of last year. And then as lockdowns ended, I took my family on a road trip around Malaysia, around the peninsula. We went to the East Coast and to Kelantan and uh, it was really quite amazing. Uh, and of course, we ended the whole trip with uh, a wonderful two weeks in my hometown of Penang. Now, it really was quite amazing to see how Penang has handled the pandemic and of course, the resilience of my fellow Penangites. But amidst all of this, I must say that not everybody has been able to handle the pandemic in quite the same way. Which brings me to the topic of inequality. Now, inequality means not just fair access to jobs, but also to education, basic sanitation, civil liberties, and of course, economic opportunities. Now, inequality is a subject on which my next guest is able to address quite eloquently. His name is Dr. Lee Hock An. He's the author of Affirmative Action in Malaysia and South Africa, Preference for Parity. It is a book which was published last year by Rotledge. And he's also the author, uh, Hogan, of numerous articles in academia and uh, in the media. He's written on subjects like affirmative action, uh, inequality, discrimination, social protection, labor and education. Now, Hogan is a senior fellow and coordinator of the Malaysia Studies Program at the ICS Yusuf Ishak Institute in Singapore. He's also a PhD holder in economics from the University of Massachusetts Amherst and inequality forms a key tenet of Hogan's work a subject on which he has studied and written academic papers on since the early 90s. Now, I know my channel doesn't really uh, discuss politics or politicians, but um, unfortunately, inequality and the policies which guide inequality traverses the public uh, policy arena. So, uh, in advance of uh, this uh, conversation, I must uh, try to say that, you know, at least we try to traverse those subjects uh, as, as delicately and as sensitively as possible. So without further ado, here is my conversation with uh, Dr. Lee Hock An. Well, Hock An, thank you for doing this. Uh, I gather you're talking to me all the way from the sunny shores of Singapore. Um, and you've been studying this whole issue of inequality for a very long time. One of the things that afflicts the entire world, and especially in Malaysia, so we can start, if possible, with your um, University of Am uh, Massachusetts dissertation from about 11 odd years ago. You uh, examined racial inequality, affirmative action, both here and in South Africa. And, you know, South Africa is quite commonly known as a policy where it was actually meant, designed to help the um, minority. But in the case of Malaysia, it's quite the opposite. So if you can just, I, th I guess, talk broadly, and I guess maybe more importantly, constructively, um, from Malaysia's standpoint, where we where we are on, on all that uh, um, um, inequality. You asked about the uh, South Africa and Malaysia comparison. Uh, well, firstly, thank you so much, uh, Chuan, for uh, this privilege to uh, share my thoughts, uh, research, and well, I think with your guidance, maybe uh, make it you know understandable, uh, you know, to uh, to the interested uh, and engaged uh, person. I think it does take you know some degree of of a hard thinking, but I don't think it's too difficult. I think it's, it's uh, you know, I think we can find ways, and I think this is part of in my journey to find ways that uh, to be able to understand and, and, and grasp and communicate these issues. I think they're contentious, but not necessarily very complex. So, uh, so again, back to the, yeah, I mean, the starting point actually is before the PhD. Uh, it's about 20 years now, I think, since my master's, I took an interest in, in, in equality. Uh, but I think it, it grew over time. And um, with the PhD dissertation, yeah, it was an opportunity firstly to launch uh, into a comparative study. Uh, I was, so I had been studying, you know, Malaysia, new economic policy, inequality and so on. Um, but when coming, when it came to a huge project like a PhD uh, dissertation, uh, firstly, I was just frankly quite bored just studying Malaysia. <laughs> Uh, and South Africa was, you know, they are gravitationally pulled together. But I must clarify that we're talking about uh, post-apartheid South Africa as a comparison for Malaysia. So it's for favoring uh, the black majority, which is about 90% yeah. of the population. Yeah, and that cons consists of uh, African, sort of the official categories, African, colored, and, and Indian, 90%. And Malaysia, Bumi Putra is about uh, 70%. Uh, so uh, what's really uh, fascinating about the, the study uh, that there's no two other countries that have, uh, there are a few others that are majority favoring, but none of the kind of magnitude 
and complexity as Malaysia and, and South Africa. Um, now, I want to draw, I got to pull back a little bit and explain what is, what is affirmative action as I define it. Um, and I think as the international literature, which is comparing different countries. I must say at the onset that it's not defined based on minority as a target group. Uh, it can be majority, it can be minority. The defining feature is that it's a disadvantaged group that is underrepresented in particular areas, especially higher education, especially in the upper tiers of the labor market, in business and in uh, ownership. And these are, these are particular uh, layers, right? Where if a group is um, underrepresented, they are not participating um, uh, in, in universities, in decision-making positions, it affects the esteem of the group, it affects the perception of themselves and others would be perceived. Um, and so many countries have undertaken right, to engage in a policy that will promote uh, representation, especially in these areas. So it's about moving, it's more about upward mobility. It's not so much about targeting uh, you know, the, the poor, although in some ways you can try to also uh, you know, make this benefit the poor, especially for entering into uh, university. So Malaysia and South Africa both have very extensive affirmative action. That is to provide to, um, through some kind of a preferential uh, treatment, but with quite contrasting uh, mechanisms in the two countries, so that a target group, the Blacks in South Africa, the Bumi Putras in, in Malaysia, um, can enter university at a more, it facilitates it. So it makes the, the process happen at a, at a faster rate, uh, upward in, in the labor market into professional and management positions um, in participating in business and, and in uh, ownership. In many countries, it's more focused on either only public sector employment or only in uh, higher uh, education. So that's just, uh, you know, that, that, that's the basis as well. Not just that they are both majority favoring uh, but it's also very, very uh, extensive. And the majority group holds political uh, power. So that was also the other, uh, other element. Of course, there's a lot more, but I think maybe, you know, just, just for a start. Yeah. Um, so on the basis of what you, you just said, Hogan, um, it's not just monetary, yeah? It's not just the economic inequality. It is also academic, um, public voice, um, you know, obviously uh, utilities, as you say, access to basic, basic um basic rights and, and so forth. So on that on that premise, maybe the majority group in Malaysia may not be on par with the educated urbans. But then you could also say the same thing about the you know about the about the other um, ethnic groups as well, whether it's Indians or Kadazans or Kalabits or even Chinese, right? Because as we know, um, access to the upper tiers of society are not available to everybody, um, only to the privileged few. So so I mean when you get granular in terms of your research, right? Um where are the main flaws with the Malaysian experience? I think it's important, and I always make a point about this to uh, you know situate the experience in the current uh, uh, con conditions in in context. I mean, it's not to make it you know dense and, and academic, but I I think it's really really uh, you know essential that we, we recognize firstly how extensive it is right now. And I think we are mindful of that. Uh, you know, people are very quick to, to, to bring up what they know and, and, and their own complaints or their defense of the system. But where it also comes from again. So I wanna go back to, um, and, and, and this is also common across both countries. Why are these particular areas, um, why are there, you know, why have countries like Malaysia and South Africa uh, intervened to promote a particular population group? Uh, in this case, right, uh, ethno, uh, ethnic group, racial groups. Um, because these are, partic as I, uh, I think I want to uh, expand a bit, because just now I said that, yeah, these are positions that, you know, confer some degree of esteem, right, and influence. I mean, if we just reduce it down from the whole population, right, to a, a family or a village, imagine in one family, no one has ever been to university, right? And then the first person enters university, right? Is that a big deal for them? Yeah, it's a big it deal. It's, right? If it's a village, it's, it's a big deal, right? Uh, so that's the, that's the essence behind it because it matters, right? It matters for the community, how they're perceived, and, and they can start to see that these things are, are achievable. Now, affirmative action has intervened also, though, at a time in, in particular areas where there are barriers to entry. And this is why 
the special treatment is is uh, important. And I think this, I do want to underscore this because sometimes it's not recognized enough and people just think that, oh, you can just do it any other way. You can just help the poor and, and you know, you, the community will be will benefit as well, right? If you help the poor, you're solving problems of poverty. You're not really solving, you know, the issue of the group's underrepresentation, not moving up sufficiently into universities and, and occupation and so on. Because there are barriers to entry. Barriers to entry meaning to enter university, you need, uh, you know, to meet certain academic bar. Even if you relax it, you can't just say everyone get, who wants to get in will get in, or just say all the poor should get into university, as we tend to like to think, right? Just say, oh, let it be something that is pro-poor. Even if you want to be pro-poor, you know, there are these certain qualifying marks. You need a degree to be a manager and certain amount of experience um, to, with, you know, give in ordinary conditions. The terrorist purpose, if it's, you know, uh, you know, say just what, you know, the, the proverbial level playing field or perfect equality, which of course is debatable whether it can ever be that way, right? But if you, if you only look at, you know, qualifications, right? And you have the compounded disadvantages and structural disadvantages that can affect groups over time, then the, these kind of changes, I think will happen very slowly. The changes meaning, you know, the blacks entering university and then moving up occupationally, for the Bumiputras entering university, moving up occupationally. So it's the intervention comes in the form of moving along the process at a faster rate because there are these barriers to entry, because you want to facilitate a group's right, um, participation, um, you know, be, that, meaning to say, yeah, you let a group in, you know, because they have uh, some historical disadvantage, they, there's uh, very few of them, you know, in the particular identified areas like universities and high level occupations, uh, despite they may not having the, the same level of qualifications. It does entail that kind of, I think we need to, I know, be, be, be clear about that. It is also known as positive uh, discrimination. Uh, you know, letting people be promoted even with a bit less experience than their, their counterparts, because that is the policy objective. So there are these preferential elements to it. I think I, I make it a point to say this because in Malaysian context, I see that, you know, it's, it's not acknowledged enough that particular feature, right, um, on, on all sides of, of, of the debate. I think some would like to deny that those things, you know, exist, um, uh, be, you know, uh, because it's something that is maybe, you know, uncomfortable. But I think, yeah, we, you know, we, we, we just, we need to find ways to, to think about it, you know, with the kind of clarity and a bit more systematic about what this policy is um, and, and, and its objectives. Now in the cup, so it goes, which goes back to where it came from. It's, it's and, and th those features remain, right? There are preferential treatment that is based on identifying a particular, um, you know, uh, based on identity. It's not so much based on socioeconomic uh, disadvantage, but there's some overlap. Maybe we can talk about that a bit, a bit uh, you know, uh, later. Now, in the current situation, right, the question is not whether this is needed, okay, not so much. I mean, to me, I think the, the defining question um, is, well, what do you do about it now that it has become so embedded, right, and so um, uh, extensive, um, the, the, the ultimate objective, right, um, in my view, and this is also articulated a bit more implicitly, but I think it's there in the new economic uh, policy. Vision 2020 also had some statements that were quite um, bold in terms of what the Bumiputra, you know, what, what the, the, the objectives for them in the long term. In, in the new economic policy, it was uh, framed as full partnership or to be full partners in the economic life of, of the nation. Uh, Vision 2020 aspired for Bumiputras to be fully competitive and on par with non Um And, but we kind of uh, tread very delicately and, and it's a bit, you know, muffled and quite muddled on, on, on this issue nowadays. I think in, we also need to, uh, you know, acknowledge that that really should be the ultimate uh, objective because these are policies, you know, that do provide a leg up do provide a preferential treatment, special opportunity for a certain group, 
that really needs to uh, be used, right? It needs to be leveraged, to uh, utilized to develop the uh, capability and competitiveness of the group. So if you ask me about what is, uh, you know, a kind of a one-liner about the object, about the outcome of these policies, I would say that it's been very extensive in promoting access and in dispersing opportunity. Uh, but it's really fallen short in developing capability and competitiveness. And you know, that, that's why I think we are, we are mired in the situation right now um, of be, being a bit hard, very hard to, to, uh, to move on because I think the, um, it's, it's a very uh, strained kind of situation where a group, the beneficiaries, don't really don't feel uh, sufficiently uh, empowered and confident, right, to undertake major changes. Changes meaning, right, shifting away from a very direct and overt uh, preferential treatment. And I think others that have also grown a bit, you know, uh, in, in, impatient, and they are sort of pent up grievances about the system and, and some of the uh, uh, unfairness in it. Uh, but they also just go about attacking only, right? And so there's a lot of talking past uh, each other on both sides and sort of just, you know, uh, flinging accusations and, and, and pointing out flaws on the other side. And we haven't really found a way to, to find some kind of new uh, common ground and way to have a constructive dialogue. But I hope, I mean, one of my, uh, you know, goals in the last 10 years is, has been to try and find ways that, that, you know, we can actually have a constructive dialogue about this. It's becoming tough, right? Because it's becoming inconvenient to do so. In fact, it's become very inconvenient. It's, it's part of the problem, the fact that the majority are also in government and the government have interspersed these policies with racial and um, religious ideologues such that it becomes... Um, not even inconvenient. It becomes injurious to their political prospects if they were to start to dial back some of these policies because they cannot any longer dial back these policies despite clear evidence that um, the compromises that they've made throughout the years to accommodate you know, um, the disenfranchised in, into academia, into professional life, into working life, into the civil service has created you know, obvious gaps with the rest of the region. So, so they're, it's in, in, a, in short, they're, cut, they're, they're caught in a bit of a catch-22 situation. So how, how do, what solutions can you provide to them, you know, to the political masters um, to somehow come out of this quagmire? Yeah, the, the political uh, vested interests, I think, you know, is, is unquestionable. Uh, but it's, I think of, I think there's also a bit of misreading, even the even from the political elite uh, them, themselves. I think one aspect of it is, you know, the discourses on on the NEP. Um, uh, from from the official standpoint, in the first place, so it it is rooted, I think, in in the, the policy, um, you know, Malaysia plans and, and the policy documents, uh, but and then the, and the, also the. The, the popular responses to it, uh, with the fixation with the thirty percent equity, right, and that has translated into I think yeah not just as a target but over time you know in the eighties and the nineties what was really uh, prominent in the agenda was privatization uh, before that heavy industries and then but especially the privatization in the late eighties until the Asian financial uh, crisis. Um, and I think at the, at the expense of uh, programs that could have done more of a, on, on a more up, you know, bottom up basis, building the capabilities through the education system, uh, through grooming uh, small enterprises, growing them into medium scale and, and, and so on. But the attack as well, uh, of, of the policy uh, critique, I think, has been also inordinately right, focused on the, the 30%. I mean, some, sometimes, you know, the argument goes, it's as though that, like, oh, as we just need to prove that Bumiputra equity exceeds 30%, mm -hmm. and then the whole NDP 
you know, uh, the case for identity collapses, and then we can, you know, move on and, and get rid of the whole thing. Um, it's just not going to work that way because it is also from the critique standpoint, you know, just focus on one aspect of a, of a huge system. And I think, yes, that is the one where, yeah, they, I think there are definitely vested interests in terms of contracting, right? Um, in terms of access to, um, to assets, right? To, to shares that have, uh, you know, where there, there are some uh, regulations, although not, not so much as, uh, as, as before, you know, we don't have as much of this massive uh, and mandated distribution of shares, although you can see that it's making a bit of a comeback. Uh, but I think you can see that in the contracting, right? And so, yes, that is one as aspect of it. But I think there's been a huge a flaw in a lot of the discourses that is also, again, uh, it kind of extrapolates, right? Or it superimposes those problems onto the whole system. So that is, you know, the meaning that if we can fix that, then everything, the whole system also is, is fixed. Or if we, if we can get rid of, you know, the, this cronism, Right then, the whole NEP kind of you know is, is is solved, because there's also all this higher education. There's also technical colleges. There's microfinance and small loans, and many of these that uh, benefit a lot of people in all the years. Right, there are millions who benefit, and millions who have benefited over over so many decades through getting you know small loans, through being helped. Right as a uh, um, you know, to, to be uh, in their trade, right? In, uh, hawker, right, even, to enter technical colleges and so on. And so society, right, is very steeped in it, is very much, <clears throat> um, has received so much of these benefits, and there's a lot of support for it. There's a lot of support from, from ordinary uh, Malays and, and Bumiputras. So it's not just about a political uh, problem, that the vested interests of the elites, right? But all of society that also has, uh, you know, an interest, I mean, not just like in a very, uh, you know, self-seeking uh, manner, but it's just people have uh, grown up in a system, right? That keeps delivering them benefits. So why would they not? Well, isn't this injurious to any nation over the long term, right? Because at some point in time, you cannot have a population of, you know, for want of a better word, lotus eaters, because lotus eaters do not build nations. They, they crumble nations, yeah? Um, that's the first thing. Yeah, and, yeah. and the second thing is, if you have a minority supporting a majority, eventually the minority dies a natural death or they disappear by, whether by attrition or by exodus, and then they go away. And then what's left is a, is, is a majority, you know, overwhelmingly of lotus eaters. And, and you know, you know, natural resources can only go so far. So that's that's. I find that inherently the long term problem because you cannot have one person feeding three. You can have two persons feeding two, or one or three persons feeding one, but you can't have one feeding four. Yeah, yeah. That's why. That's why I think the the emphasis, you know, uh, needs to be on how all of this, the whole system that is dispersing the benefits, um, you know, is effectively uh, developing, right. Uh, capabilities and skills and knowledge and competitiveness. I must add one more thing, right? Because um, society has, you know, Malaysia has, has, has changed, right? The NEP has been uh, 50 years, this, this year is the 50th uh, anniversary. And sometimes we talk about it as though it was one static blob of huge, you know, one entity. You know, we cannot, it's, it's quite meaningless to say, talk about the NEP even, you know, as one thing. Or that we can actually think of keeping it, or 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 or, or you know, or, or ditching it, right? Because what is it anyway? And there's so many parts to it, and some parts of it have actually come and gone. But another, uh, you know, development in the last ten years is an expansion of policies that are in the same domain, but targeting other groups as well. I mean, it's a much so it's really 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 dwarf, but you know, they are they they are in existence because there's a logic to it. Right for uh, the Indian community, for Orang Asli, um, there are some interventions for women as well. Where they are involved, uh, you know, where where do they, um, where are they uh, implemented? Uh, mainly again in higher education, um, in SME development, uh, women uh, in you know board membership and decision making positions. 
see, that's the logic again. In some, of course, predominantly it's pro, you know, Boeing Putra is the designated beneficiaries, but this, all these other ones have also uh, emerged, right? Why? Because it's, it's driven by that logic that there are barriers to entry. And if society feels that, you know, it's important, it is, you know, uh, legitimate, it is in the national interest for there to be more equitable representation. So the Indian community, right, in some, you know, where uh, through structural disadvantages and, and I think for many decades, you know, being sort of the, yeah, the odd one out, right, in between, neither uh, not qualifying based on identity, but not enjoying some of the uh, uh, private, right, household, uh, you know, uh, advantages uh, of the other communities that can kind of afford their way or that provide, you know, a very condu more conducive environment uh, for, for learning and, and, and so on. So we have kind of accepted that, you know, these are part of um, the, the fabric, right? The policy fabric that are group targeted for different groups. I try to uh, draw more attention to this because, um, you know, it, I hope it can be one way that we can we can have a, this kind of conversation, right? Without then everyone just straight away taking sides and yeah. being pro or against, because people do that, and it's I you know I there's a contradiction. You're anti pro Bumiputra group targeted policies, but you, you're pro Orang Asli and pro Indian, right? Yeah. I think we need to think about how these things you know can strive a balance rather than just being you know, anti this and anti that. Yeah, I, I think you've hit the nail on the head where I'm personally concerned as well because I find it very pro problematic that the Malaysian political discourse and policy framework have largely been drawn along racial and, um, you know, racial lines th through the years rather than on a needs-based uh, basis, right? Because um, if you were to say this sector needs help or that sector needs help, then what about that sector? Because Malaysia is a highly, highly fragmented society. Um, you know, when you look at MA63, well, the East Malaysians won their rights and privileges. You know, on the on the peninsula, the Bumiputras won their privileges. And then everybody kind of like stands up and says, hey, what about me? I'm being left out, right? Um, you, you know, when you look at highly equitable societies around the world, yeah, um, I presume this would include the Scandinavian countries, the Denmarks of this world, the Norwegians, the Norways of this world. You know, yes, smaller populations. But uniformly wealthy, uniformly educated, uniformly participative in society and in government, what is the template from there that we can learn from? You know, because yes, Hogan, inequality exists all over the world, America included. Some of the richest countries in the world are highly divided along wealth lines. America is a fantastic example. But then the Norwegians are not, nor are the Danish. Yes, only 7 million Danish, but, you know, they're all pretty, you know, they're doing pretty well for themselves. Yeah, that's a tough question. I mean, I uh, haven't done as much com comparison, you know, that, that widely. Uh, because as you see with Malaysia, South Africa, right, the, you know, the particularities uh, are, are so uh, important in the historical uh, uh, trajectory. Um, uh, but I think uh, more, more broadly, you know, there are countries where, yeah, there is an extensive redistributive system. There is, I think it starts with countries that have a bit more trust in, in the institutions. Uh, and and it's, it's a feedback loop, right? It's a virtual cycle. When things work, uh, then people also don't mind being, you know, uh, taxed much more uh, for the extensive, you know, public uh, services. And much more, so we're talking about specifically the, the, the Nordic, Northern European model, uh, social democracy. Of, I mean, they, they kind of, you know, vacillate around with coalition governments, right? Uh, but I think at a core, right, they, they all have these uh, uh, elements of the, uh, you know, high, 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 more, more uh, redistributive system. So, in fact, when you look at some of the inequality data, the uh, market outcome, Right, so market-based in, in uh, income. That is just what you the take home. Uh, the, the the is it would it be? Yeah, I guess you could say it's take home pay, uh, pre-tax anyway. Right, the inequality is, is is higher, and then you measure that again. You account for after-tax and tax uh, and um, and the transfers, 
uh, meaning to say the amounts that are received by the mainly the lower uh, income, then uh, the inequality is, is much uh, lower. So I, uh, I mean, this has come up as well in context of Malaysia and, and being proposed that, you know, Mal Malaysia would need to uh, do, uh, re 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 reformulate, so find a new balance of uh, the, in the whole system. But I don't see this as, you know, so much related to the issues of you know, ethnicity and, and uh, affirmative action. Um, it's, it's more about the general income and wealth uh, distribution. I mean, certainly there are, there's, some, there's some overlaps. Yeah. Okay, so, so, you know, from a layman like perspective like me, when I look at, say, the, the Danish or the Swedish, right, um, one template for success could be the fact that they're quite homogenous in nature. All of them are blonde, blue-eyed, you know, white, um, you know, Anglo-Saxon kind of like orientations. They don't have Malay, Indian, Chinese, you know, um, whatever, right? Um, they also speak the same language and have done so for, you know, hundreds of years. And I think the third thing is that they've got a functioning democracy, which is what you alluded to in, the, in you know, previously. So when you've got trust in the system, then you by and large conform to it. So we can't have that in Asia. We can't have that in Malaysia, where we're highly fragmented, highly divided society by all those metrics, right? So is the other template for success, say, a China, yeah, where, you know, you've got a very, very strong and overbearing, to the point of overbearing government, where if they say jump, you say how high, on pain of death. So then things get done. The other possible template could be the ties, where, you know, obviously the government may not be as solid or stable or overbearing as the Chinese, but then they are one nation by way of name, by way of language, and, you know, by and large uh, of, of identity, even though there's, there's you know, um, native Chinese and native Malay, you know, uh, um, race, r racial backgrounds in there. I know you've studied, you know, inequality from an ASEAN perspective. What does your research tell you about other ASEAN nations? Which ones are less in, uh, unequal and why have they succeeded or less failed less? Uh, it was a good point about the uh, <clears throat> relative hom homogeneity and also societies, you know, that uh, have a more of a assimilation uh, model. I mean, even with a lot of receiving uh, my uh, refugees, right, in, in some of these countries, you know, they provide uh, the, the they, they open the border, but also then, you know, uh, provide the means, but eventually, right, to the, the, the refugees would become, you know, speaking the language. Um, and I mean, retaining the culture surely as well, right? But it's just, again, we have a very different scenario because it's, it's, a, it's, it's a small sliver of, of society, you know, not, 20% or 30% kind of a minority. Uh, Malaysia, I mean, even if you talk about comparing with, with, with China, you know, China is not homogenous, but you know, it's, the differences are not, right? Uh, as in Malaysia, right? It's, I mean, to use the term civilizational, but I think, you know, can be yeah, described that way. I know it would be <laughs> contentious by some, uh, but right, with, with, with the uh, Malay, Indian, uh, Chinese, and 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 uh, multi race you know, language different languages uh, you know that different written language as well. This is part of the unique richness, right? And and, and the challenge as well. I think with with uh, Malaysia, um, that you know is you you know uh, I find it uh, hard to 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 think about oh uh, you know. An alternative that can be that can be adopted that is clearly a much more of uh, assimilation, you know, uh, model. Um, we have the streams in the Chinese, uh, you know, the vernacular uh, schools, which uh, you know, to to me is is something you know that you know is part of the fabric of of, of Malaysia. You know, and so not something that uh, that that I mean that I you know compare with other countries and say that oh look it's all a single stream right? uh, and 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 obviously we can talk about some pluses and minuses about these things. My work on South um, South Southeast Asia was actually a book uh, I edited and co-edited uh, with uh, eight country studies. Um, so all of the ASEAN countries except for Brunei and, and Laos. 
Uh, and so just want to clarify that and acknowledge you know, that there were different uh, contributors of the different uh, chapters. And so it's interesting, I mean, not just about Southeast Asia, but you know, globally the experiences right, with, uh, with, with development because structural change happens with development where countries go from lower income and being more uh, agriculture based, uh, agriculture and services. And as they industrialize, sometimes that leads to rising inequality because you have a gap between urban and rural that grows, right? And uh, because of you know, the disparities uh, within the manufacturing can also be higher. So inequality is higher and you can have uh, uh, more gaps between the rich and the poor because there's just more opportunity to become rich. So, so the lower meaning, what I'm trying to, you know, the, the, what I'm getting at is that the lower inequality countries, which we associate lower inequality is a good thing, but they are, they are the lower income countries. Right? In, South Af in Southeast Asia, it holds, globally it holds as well. Uh, so that's countries uh, like uh, Cambodia and, and, and Myanmar. Inequality is lower um, than the middle income countries uh, in the region of you know, Malaysia, Thailand, uh, Philippines. Um, and that's also, uh, you can see globally, right? the, some of the highest in, in income inequality um, is in some of the Latin American countries. South Africa would be another one as well. So these are uh, upper middle uh, income countries. But one thing about South Africa, uh, South, keep saying South Africa, Southeast Asia, um, and a mo main motivation for, for the, the book is that some countries have been experiencing rising inequality and some have been experiencing declining income inequality. Uh, but for the most part, actually, in the last 10, 15 years, uh, Southeast Asian countries have experienced uh, declining inequality. Um, is based on household income, uh, based on uh, consumption uh, inequality. So it's not uh, wealth, which is um, you know a, a different dimension, um, and the level of income wealth inequality is um, invariably higher. But we really, but we have much less data about the trends of wealth inequality. But the book was trying to touch on that as well to discuss you know the different these different forms uh, and, and account for you know, why income inequality uh, seems to be declining. Uh, but there's also a lot of uh, dissatisfaction in Malaysia in the region and this perception of rising inequality. I think uh, the conspicuous right, um, consumption, the, the conspicuous wealth accumulation is what you know, frames or shapes this view of rising inequality. Uh, and of course, you know, it's kind of this, it's, it's, it's the zeitgeist issue, right? Of the 1% and, and, and this 99% you know, uh, being uh, excluded, left behind, or, 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 or you know, uh, powerless in, in, in a system that is uh, trickling up. I think that uh, is predominantly related to wealth inequality. I find it interesting, Hogan, that you point out that in ASEAN, uh, income inequality is actually shrinking uh, rather than expanding because um, to, to me, it seems natural that as the economies grow and people get, well, the economy gets richer, then uh, of course the, the divide gets wider because that's how the system works, right? Um, we by and large pursue the system of capitalism where there's owners of assets and there's workers of those assets you know you got your your owners and your employees so if you are the owner then you've got your assets to leverage and to, you know to to borrow against and in an era of low interest rates they can get very very rich very very fast by pledging their real estate and their bonds and their shares and and what have you whereas the employed will get by month to month on their on their pay packet and they can't beat inflation because you know wages have not risen as fast as or faster than inflation so so i find it interesting that you know your, your study points out that inequality is, sh is shrinking so so to which then i might say or, or might um postulate that it is 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 a time that we examine a new economic system where you know it's not so much one that is western focused where it's owner-led you know uh, where you know elon musk can be worth 350 billion us dollars and his line workers are being paid, you know, minimum wage of twenty-two bucks an hour. I mean, the disparity is huge in America. 
but they are they are the most overt form of capitalism. Yeah, I mean, uh, it is surprising. I mean, you know, but the this this these trends, uh, every I you know tracked it and and uh, and then you have all these the discourse. It doesn't it doesn't square with with what people are what people tend to be saying or, or perceiving. But to clarify, these are the data that is from the household income surveys or household expenditure surveys, uh, which is nationally sampled and uh, and consistent, you know, over time. And and there's a consistent measure as well. So the Gini index is is one of the uh, commonly used ones. It's a summary, right? It provides a summary between zero and, and one, and there's a ratio there. Uh, and so it's capturing the overall picture in the whole country of all the sectors. And again, it's focused more on, on income and it's based on, you know, this actual, uh, in Malaysia, it's about 80,000 households, I think, sampled. And so it's not something, yeah, that can be, you know, readily uh, dismissed. But as I thought about it and looked at some of the underlying, possible underlying uh, factors, it, in some ways it, it can be uh, explained, you know, it's quite plausible. Because in the last 10 years, we've seen massive uh, increase in uh, higher education. Right? So the earnings premium on holding a higher uh, education degree has declined because it's just not so unique and special to have that, uh, to hold that uh, qualification. And there's also been all uh, various interventions to boost uh, income at the bottom with specifically uh, minimum wage. So these surveys are not capturing so much, you know, yeah, the stock options and, and those things because it's it's based on you know visit it's based on self-declared and also a simple form, right? Or a, a, not a, not 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 that simple, but a standard form, right? That doesn't go into all kinds of detail about you know different wealth and again it depends on what uh, what would be uh, disclosed by the when when whoever's visited will be answered. And also, uh, it, if it's probably, uh, it, it's expected, and I think that's the general experience that, that uh, when the survey enumerators visit the very rich, if they happen to be randomly sampled, right? They don't answer. So you don't really get the very rich you know, in, in, in the sample uh, as well. Uh, and I think that we could see that with around Southeast Asia because there has been quite an expansion of you know, minimum wage, uh, you take Cambodia uh, and, and quite uh, steep increases in minimum wage. Um, that's also happened in uh, Indonesia. So I think, yeah, there are these realities that I think maybe we are, we are a bit far removed from, uh, but can be picked up by, by, by the survey. And it's not saying that everything is rosy and, and, you know, and, and, and wonderful and, and, uh, and smashing success, but, but, but it is pointing to a certain trend specifically in, in income uh, inequality. Um, for Malaysia, for Southeast Asia and capitalism, yeah, we're living in these times where these things I think are being uh, exposed and are being uh, questioned. Um, I think it's not so much that really, you know, uh, very, uh, aggressive kind of American capitalism with, with huge, uh, you know, as much of that kind of runaway uh, wealth um, and, and also or, as organized and ideologically, uh, ideological opposition to things like minimum wage. I mean, government has been able to do that and, and, and push, push, push through with that. You know, the finance business sector is, is I think not, not, not so, um, yeah, not not as not not as not as organized and and as uh, aggressive. I think that you find in places like the U.S. Um, so yeah, I mean it's something yeah that that you know I think is timely to be asking uh, questions about the overall how how societies you know how the economy right is is going to be uh, organized uh, and the balance of these institutions of you know social protection that are and 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 how to uh, continue right? or to, to continue to provide fair opportunity or to expand fairness in the system. Yeah. 
So, so at this point in time, it seems quite challenging, and you know, one might say that inequality is also another word for uh, corruption as a manifestation of rather than yeah, because corruption breeds you know inequality in terms of access to those juicy privileges and juicy contracts. Um, so, so what what is what do you think the next ten years holds for Malaysia? Uh, and and I think I think perhaps more pertinently. How Malaysia comes out of this whole issue of inequality, via v the rest of the region, where you you know we are we are now increasingly being measured against the likes of Indonesia and Vietnam and Thailand and Singapore and Indonesia, where you know by population size they are quite a lot larger than us or quite a lot wealthier than us in the case of Singapore. If we don't address inequality, it's it it becomes a case of the race to the bottom where we are concerned because we keep on compromising. Uh, academic standards to allow more people in. We keep on allowing, you know, m- maybe subpar uh, workers into the workforce because we need to give them jobs. You know, so across the board, whether at the working level and definitely corporation tax or individual tax collections are concerned, or even in academia where you need to prepare the best workers to come into the workforce, those standards are being compromised. So, in the, in the standpoint of uh, the regional comparison, you know, and ten years out. Best case, worst case. I mean, you have struck a positive tone, you know. <laughs> so, so does that continue? You know, do we see that trend line continue, or do we kind of see a flat, see a flat lining? Well, the backdrop of the declining, uh, you know, uh, inequality, I think, you know, is is all those things that you uh, mentioned. Uh, you know, it's uh, we we have seen right the you know massification of of higher education. Uh, but a lot of uh, questions about uh, quality and I think evidence right of uh, decline in, in quality or at least you know the standards are not up, up, up to scratch. You know it's it's a, such a complex issue and I think it comes back to you know a, a balance right of continuing to provide that access. I think it's it is a binding political and social constraint on government regardless you know, whatever coalition, whatever the shape, if it's a, uh, if it's race-based parties coalition, if it's multi-ethnic parties, it's the same. You're going to, in, you know, the, the 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 system is is as it is, with very extensive uh, policies. I might, I just want to remind, right, you and the listeners, uh, not just the existence of the pro Bumputra, but there's also the ones, you know, programs for Asli and others, and so again. Coming back to how to balance the continuing access, but um, and this is the really hard part, right? As you mentioned, to promote uh, you know the standards, to do it in a way right that is um, developing, uh, expanding knowledge, developing uh, capability, and so on. And so that it has to be accompanied, yeah, by some um, concerted efforts in the uh, competencies of the higher education, uh, the technical universities, um, I think maybe to, to also relook at, I think a system that has been very much focused on auditing as the means to, you know, to, to safeguard standards, right? The kind of MQA, and I was involved in the universities and saw that firsthand that uh, it, it it's just taken too far and, and it's all about just bookkeeping and ticking boxes and I think it needs to there, there needs to be a really uh, rigorous and a really brutal examination about how you know in, in, in education to go back to a system that I, or, or to to shift towards one that is really empowering the educators um, to you know to do their job right um, and, and to trust them a little bit more and to select the people who can, who, who can uh, do that job. I think the selection of those opportunities. So uh, uh, I think a lot of times we, we, yeah, we do act out of, and an, uh, say out of an understandable uh, frustration with the, you know, with, with, with the corruption that we see, cronism, the, the, the patronage, um, and so there's misallocations, right? You have these uh, contracts that are, you know, given based on connections, not not uh, capability. Um, but sometimes the reaction against that also swings a bit towards, right? Oh, so but you know, just get rid of 
the uh, corruption as though that, and 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 um, without acknowledging, I think, right, that there is still uh, that system that needs to provide and that needs to provide some kind of equitable, uh, you know, distribution. Meaning to say, like something like you know, public procurement. Um, can that be totally overhauled to, and I've done some re research on this uh, lately, right? I mean, I think it's a fair point, you know, and you can say, you know, just, you know, um, open competition everywhere, right? And, uh, you know, no more any preferred uh, group or, or identity. Um, that's to me is kind of, you know, you've made your point. It can actually, it, it's actually, uh you have a moral basis to what you say you have sound principles right it makes a lot of sense but it's just not a political you know it's just a political non-starter in my experience looking at these kind of problems we acknowledge that yes the problems of the post-election right and and they do derive from abuse of a system that is giving preference uh but uncomfortable as it is maybe to admit you know we have to find a program of action, right? That is uh, methodical, right? But you cannot just jettison it all. You cannot just, you know, get rid of the entire system like that. We have to find ways that are doing more rigorous selection, that are doing better monitoring, that provide more incentives to upgrade, to move up in, um, in scale. Yeah, and I'm, so just to be clear, this is really to, you know, you, you cannot just say, get rid of us, the, the pro uh, Bumiputra uh, policies in some of these areas. But the next, uh, where the action needs to happen, I think, is to actually make them uh, successful. Meaning to say, be more rigorous in selecting those who, who, who then can succeed and be a demonstration to others. And also you can start to think about capping certain, uh, you know, setting certain limits. So I want to follow up on what you have brought up just now about need-based, right? Because I think that is often um, bandied about as some alternative to race-based. And I have spent a lot of time, you know, um, uh, unpacking that uh, and bringing about a, a, what I, well, I hope, right, is, is a more, clarity about this. So it's not a rejection of, of these need-based policies. I think they're coming from a place that, you know, is <clears throat> uh, a certain uh, moral standpoint, right? That we should be helping those who need help. That, and there's a certain aversion to policies that are based on, um, on race. So I've already addressed some of that. I think let's not just be so anti-race-based policies, but welcome or not, but Look for ways to balance group targeted policies that are different, where there are, can be different uh, designated groups, Bumiputra, Orangasti, Indian, other minorities, and so on, and women. Um, but when we say need based as a replacement for race based, right, I think it's very problematic when it's done in this very you know, sweeping and often a very nebulous way. I have no idea really usually when people actually say that as an alternative uh, whole paradigm or a whole system, what that means. Uh, all they end up saying is, oh, help the poor because they need help. And the Bumiputras are the majority of the poor, so they will benefit anyway. Yeah, that's true. The, which means you are helping the poor and the, you're helping the Bumiputra poor, but it's not really addressing all those other areas, especially where uh, you know, the Bumiputra policies are in place in procurement, in SME uh, development, right, in higher education. You can't just say help the poor and then, you know, uh, and, 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 and then Bumiputra uh, development in all those areas is going to happen. In those areas, you know, um, especially something like, you know, SME development and, and public procurement, right? Can you go, can, you, can we have a pro-poor meaning to say, give more contracts to poor people, give more SME loans to poor people, right? Yeah, you're shaking your head, right? When you actually think about what it entails, Right, because what it means is instead of helping being giving preference to Bumiputra, um, it means giving preference to the poor. 
So it applies in higher education to some extent. I talked about that a bit just now, you know, because uh, yeah, you can give uh, a preferential uh, admissions, you know, to someone from a disadvantaged background, because you recognize that they come from certain circumstances that are beyond their control. That's an important factor because it's a young person, 18, 19 years old, about to enter university, still a dependent, right? And you recognize that they can be given a leg up because of those circumstances. Um, and to then you go and study, right? But that's about it. That, that, that's what they need to do. You just need to study, um, you know, and, and hopefully you do well. But if you don't do well, you know, it's uh, not the end of the world. It's not really sort of the damage, so to speak, is a bit contained. Right? Yeah, yeah. But if you do something like promote a manager or give a contract, right, to, uh, you know, build a, a school canteen, right? Can you give that to the contractor who is poorer? Okay, so so different tech, rather than needs-based or race-based, these uh, remain nonetheless assistance programs where you help people, yeah? But then when you analyze human nature intrinsically, and I think all of us realize this, right? Adversity does bring out the best in human beings. It's quite Darwinian. Like, you know, the discovery that only the strong survive. And if you're not strong enough, then you perish because you must perish because you're not strong enough to survive the next generation. So if on that basis we take uh, humankind as an experiment and of course countries an exp as an experiment, then should it not be the case where, you know, look, if you're not smart enough, if you don't work hard enough, if you're not strong enough, well then you deserve to die. It sounds evil, it sounds almost Machiavellian, but it's very effective because that, that, you know evolution is very effective, right? That's why great white sharks and that's why leopards and cougars or whatever <laughs> survive till today. And that's why the marsupials are nearly gone. Um, the problem with that is we've got democracy and democracy is an act of popularity. It's, it's, a, it's a procession of popularity. So if you must be popular, you must help people and you must dole out what are essentially goodies. Without democracy, like you have in, say, for example, China, well, well, then you've got a very effective system. Do you know what I mean? So if you continue this, this policy of assistance, of help, of privileges, of benefits, you are only making your people weaker. Yeah? It's a bit like a drug. If I give you heroin every day for the last 50 years, you are naturally going to want heroin tomorrow, the week after, and, and the year after. So then the thing to do, the panacea, is to take away that heroin and say, sort yourself out, Go and work your socks off because if you don't, you're gonna die. I mean, sure. I mean, point, point, point taken. Uh, of course, you know we, we cannot just uh, make conclusions about policy, you know, based on 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 uh, analogies and allegories. Well, Nietzsche was uh, right. But, Nietzsche, but, uh, Nietzsche, you know, Professor Nietzsche uh, made a very good point. He said that you know that which does not kill you only makes you stronger, and he was right. I mean, I think you can keep that in the backdrop. And I think it's not something that uh, people will, I think most people will acknowledge, you know, that uh, uh, dependency, right, on, on uh, privilege, on uh, <coughs> access, you know, is in the long run, it's, it's not a good thing. Um, again, I come back to my, my, my work, in my work and, you know, uh, writings, I, I try to foresee uh, in a way Right, the kind of uh, feasibilities uh, in in making proposals for um, change, for enhancement, and 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 moving into in that direction. Um, as I said, I think it's what is really fallen short is how the system has you know um, not adequately developed capacity and and uh, uh, competitiveness. I mean, affirmative action, you know, is, 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 uh, is a very messy solution, but it is intervening in societies that are also very messy. I mean, you, it's easy to point out all the flaws and things that have gone wrong, you know, but we still don't really know the counterfactual. And I think sometimes it's a bit too simplistic and a little bit too, uh, you know, self-satisfied when people will just point to and say that, look, you know, race relations gotten worse, or, you know, there's been more, racial distinction, so affirmative action has caused it. We should get rid of it and everyone will live happy together. Well, affirmative action before it happened, when it was introduced, there were racial categories. Malaysia had a riot, uh, you know, and, and, and violence. Uh, 
um, and and people were not not all just you know get, getting getting along, and and stereotypes and stigmas were there. So we don't know if Malaysia had taken a different path, what would have happened. But I don't think it would be so simplistic, right? It's overly simplistic to say that uh, we would have grown faster. We would have you know uh, we would have been more integrated, more united if we didn't have affirmative action. Um, I think affirmative action needs to be criticized. I think it has a lot of problems, right? Uh, but again, you know, it is, um, so I, okay, I'm coming to the question again, right? About your, the, your, your question that uh, how to, yeah, how to make that transition. Um, I, I think it's, you know, uh, we cannot have a, we, we cannot propose Governments cannot propose policies that will overly disrupt. Sort of the mantra of this day is disruption, right? Throw people in the deep end or accept, you know, failure is, is an, an, an embrace of failure. Uh, it's one thing for, you know, people who, who have, you know, venture capital seed funds and, 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 or, or maybe, uh, you know, fall back and living with uh, uh, parents, or, or maybe it's they're very resourceful to do it all on their own, right? Uh, but education is the biggest one because it has the most uh, outreach. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's a non-starter when I, again, I think to, to introduce a policy that will just, you know, have uh, leave many, leave ma masses of people, right? Uh, sort of throw them into the deep and say that, look, oh, tough luck, you didn't, we, we are going to change, uh, you know, the emission system oh, you didn't get in, oh, tough luck, you know, you should have studied harder, uh, work harder, or, you know, whatever, uh, get, get a job, what a, or, 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 you know, um, swallow, this, swallow this pill, it is, it is, it is good for you, right? Uh, and I think we, we see that because we've had change of government and they were not able to bring about these kind of drastic changes. There will be a revolt. You will trigger, and it's not just because, you know, um, it's not just like people are, are you know, uh, uh, are just being uh, unreasonable, you know, or, or, or this sort of um, herd behavior. It's because there's a whole system that people have grown up in, sort of families that have said, plan for this, right, for the children to, you know, go into a, to residential school, go to a university, uh, to college and university and if you just suddenly pull that rug out from under them then it's that that's the, the kind of a disruption right that I think cannot really be contemplated from a policy or political standpoint what can happen I think and where I unfortunately though I you know I, I, I bring up but you no know, no one really ever talks about it um, is well given that you have such a system right you really have to make it work better like the matriculation college, you know, it's not doing enough in terms of its syllabus, in terms of the way it is equipping the students. It can be a place that can help bridge the gap and equip students better for university. Um, you know, just as one more specific uh, example, because I think the, the focus has always, you know, has, has, has been for so long on just who is going to get in, what's the quota system, right? And, and people are just fighting for more of a quota when I think the more fundamental problem is how is this serving the students in terms of providing them a really solid pre-university education. I think since it is a major pathway for uh, Boeing Putra students, it's one of those that needs to play a more effective uh, role. I think those are the kind of preconditions that are needed before we even think of even a more um, open and competitive uh, you know, university uh, admissions, or meaning the students need to be, you know, th those gaps need, need to be closed in terms of the pre-university uh, uh, programs. Yeah, um, look, I mean, we know this is tough. We always knew it was going to be tough. Um, we've had governments come and go because of how tough it was. Uh, what, I, what I do want to say is that, you know, I think we've run out of time, but I just want to say that research like yours and individuals like you um, and the work that you do and the proposals that you put forth to the policy makers 
have a huge value and I hope you do continue to do it because it raises questions, it causes conversations like this to happen and uh, we've all got a role to play in making everybody's lives better. So, um, Hokan, I do hope you know you work, you do your work as, as continue to do it as well as you do um, and, you know, I hope that in five or ten years' time when we revisit this issue, it's going to be a much nicer playing field than what it is now. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for this chance to <laughs> share. Uh, yeah. What's what's your next uh, work going to be on? Uh, well, I've been on a bit of a frenzy this year because yeah. it's the 50th anniversary of the Nikki. Uh, yeah. Sort of churning out a whole bunch of uh, articles, and um, I mean, it, it's uh, actually been about a few years that you know some regular outputs. Which which yeah, I think I, I might compile it into something like a book. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, um, I look forward to that. Probably with, yeah, this only focus on Malaysia. So I think the Malaysia South Africa book, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's pricing is it's just unconscionable and, and, uh, <laughs> and it's not really accessible. Yeah, so I, I hope there can be something that, yeah. Electronic, on, on electronic mate, that, that's one way forward. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, possibly. possibly. Yeah. Okay, well, good luck and uh, thank you for talking to me. Hope to talk to you again soon and um, blue skies, always blue skies, never grey skies. <laughs> <laughs>